Well, good morning. Um, my name is Chad Wraith, and I get to serve here at CCF uh, primarily through the ministry of teaching and preaching. And I will be with you this morning to continue to unpack our series on James. And uh, we're towards the end of chapter four. And it's a bit today of a continuation of what Pastor Pat uh, started last week when he emphasized and stressed about the need for us to organize the hierarchy of our lives properly so that God is indeed on the throne, and as he put it, we're way down on the org chart. (laughs) And James is going to continue this morning to hammer at us, hammer at what is definitely part and a struggle of all of our lives, and that is our own arrogance and our own pride, which can kill our communion with God. And this morning, he's going to do so by hammering at the arrogance and the pride that we can have towards life itself. The sense of life being something that we can control, we can plan for, that is within our grips And in the face of such arrogance and assumption, he's going to set forth the humility of death. This arrogance or assumption can be very subtle. It can be present. For example, when we do our five or ten year financial plan, it can be present, this arrogance or assumption, very subtly, when we're doing the planning process to expand our businesses, or the assumption that can come when thinking through your 401k and retirement plans, or the assumption that can be present when you assume you have 10 years, or five years, or one more day to live. It's the assumption that's sometimes present when people who die at a young age even sometimes children where we have a sense that something was taken from them that was rightfully theirs, as if a long life is something that we have by right and not by gift. And in the face of this assumption about life that we carry so easily, this arrogance and hubris that can be so present, even so subtly, about the very breath you hold in your lungs right now, as if it is ultimately yours. James says, you are but a mist. (laughs) Here today and gone tomorrow. It is a sober realization that in not very long, the year 2121, that nobody in this room will be in this room anymore we will all be gone. There will be whole new people in this room in a short period of time. There will be a whole other pastor of this church in a short period of time. This town will be full of people that don't exist right now, and the ones that do exist will be here no more. And the world will keep going, but you won't. And is that sober realization of your humility in the face of death that James wants to press upon us this morning for the sake of a right relationship to God and to eternity. Now, admittedly, this is a difficult sermon because we really don't do a great job staring death in the eyes and talking about it. In fact, we get sort of superstitious about it sometimes. We don't want to talk about it because it may happen. If we talk about it too much, and in fact, I'm guilty of this, this sermon preparing, it was all about death, and I thought, oh, good Lord, what's going to happen to me, (laughs) or to someone I love to test me, (laughs) you know, to see if I actually believe what I'm preaching here. But we have to look it in the eyes, because James puts it in our face and says, contemplate the fact that you're going to die in order that you can truly live. Now, I know for many people, 
to stare in the face of death is like looking over the chasm of an abyss of unknown and uncertainty. What will happen when I draw my last breath? And you look at that chasm of uncertainty and there can be fear and concern what will happen. And for most of us, we do not willingly choose to jump into that abyss, but we are pushed into it by the hand of death itself. And the truth is, that very hand of death is on our backs right now and will one day push when it so chooses. Sometimes it pushes quickly. And as someone who works in healthcare and has been around the ER often, you know how quickly it can push and how suddenly it decides to push from a stroke or a heart attack or a car accident like that, the hand pushes and into death a person is thrust. And even if it isn't, isn't the quick push, even if it's the slow push of a terminal disease or the slow push of aging, Whatever and whichever way that hand decides to push, it will push, and it'll push every one of us. And into death, we will go. Now, there's two things that we can, two different ways we can cope with this stark reality of our own mortality, of our own death. One is to trivialize it so that it doesn't sting us as much to think about it. And I have found this to be the case sometimes even in the secular environment where there's no hope for anything to come, so they trivialize death as something purely natural, absorbed back into the earth from which you came. It's just a process not to be feared, not to be worried about. You, know, you, don't, you will no more care about 2121 than you did 1921 before you even existed. The problem with trivializing death is that we all have a gut instinct that there's something counter to our entire fiber of being towards life that death presents us with. Every fiber in our being screams life and pushes towards life. And so to have to encounter death, as much as we may want to think through it and trivialize it, we all know there's something not right about investing this much with this much energy and intentionality and love and passion and effort to only hit a wall of nothing. Now the other option that we can sometimes find with trivializing, I find this in Christian circles, that it's just a passageway to heaven, <laughs> that it's just a portal to your everlasting existence, that even I've heard angels will come and get you and take you up into heaven, and it won't be bad at all, and it'll just be this sort of, you know, maybe so. But even in the face of what we think about in terms of eternity, the fact that the portal through which we enter is death can be unnerving and unsettling and a bit frightening. Now, the other option to trivializing it is not to talk about it. <laughs> this probably is our common route. I don't know how many of you were contemplating your death this morning. I doubt many of you were doing so. Unfortunately, because I have to preach this Sunday, I've been contemplating it all week long. <laughs> and I will tell you, it will change how you approach situations to keep before you and in front of your mind that you will die. And what you think is important now won't be near as important in the world to come. So to curb this arrogance and hubris 
of our approach to life, this assumption that you have one more day to live. James says, contemplate your mortality. And that's what James wants us to focus on, the very humility that comes with realizing you at the end of the day, no matter how much money you have, what job you have, what possessions you've acquired, what recognitions you've received, no matter all the things you pride yourself on, you are but a mist here today, gone tomorrow. And that's the humility, the posture that is necessary for flourishing in the Christian faith. It is the posture of realizing your very mortality is possible only because of the immortal one. Your very brevity is possible because of the eternity of God. That in every way and in every situation, you're being held up in your very being because of the divine power and presence that is occurring. You are not your own. Your life does not belong to you. It is ultimately in the hands of the sovereign almighty God. And it is that recognition that will allow you to actually live as you should here on earth. It's the kind of posture and disposition I find when Jesus talks about, in Matthew 6, this disposition of heart about what you worry for. He says, do not worry about your life. What you eat or drink about your body, what you will wear. It's not life more than food and body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? Why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you not that even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what should we eat? What should we drink? What should we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you need before you even ask him. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I think because so central to a proper Christian disposition towards God is this childlike humility of trust and dependence. I think because that disposition is absolutely necessary to flourishing in the Christian faith that the wealthy are often given such a hard time by Jesus and by James and by others. Because when you acquire for yourself wealth, material possessions, when you acquire it, it necessarily, by virtue of having it, or if I won't say necessarily, I will say it strongly, will form you to think you are in control of your life. And it will necessarily force you to focus your attention and efforts on this earth and not necessarily what's to come. I think when we acquire, now remember what we talked about when it comes to being wealthy. It's not the size of your paycheck that we're talking about. If your paycheck is $20,000 a paycheck, and 19,000 of it is going through you into the world to make a difference for the kingdom of God, then you have only stored up for yourself, if you will, a thousand. And for some, that's still extremely wealthy. 
but it's a matter of acquisition for yourself that is often criticized and attacked in Scripture as hindering your ability to have the proper heart and mind towards God to lead to flourishing. Because when you acquire possessions for yourself, your sense of dependence on God can certainly decrease. You know, when Jesus says, don't worry about what you eat, I doubt any one of us right now, or not many of us, are worried about what you're going to have for lunch today. And the reason is not because you're trusting God for your lunch. The reason is because you know you've got money to go get it. And it's easy to shift in our hearts from dependence on our possessions instead of our dependence on God. I think this is why Jesus says in Luke, Woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. We can easily begin in the pursuit and passion for the possession of material goods to get distracted from storing up what will last eternally. It is easy to focus on the now and the acquisition of the now as a distraction from the everlasting. And so we are warned of this constantly about where your focus is and attention is. I think this is why you've heard the the old, you know, Jesus says it's easier for a camel (laughs) to enter an eye of a needle than for a rich man to get to heaven. Because of the disposition that can come so easily with the pursuit and the acquisition of wealth. And what's truly a shame in how we tend to spend our lives and where we tend to invest is that we continue to pursue that which does not satisfy in the expense of that which will satisfy. And we can sometimes misjudge where credit should be given. Those that have made much, accumulated much, had much power, had much influence, we praise. We read about them. We put them on news channels. We interview them. Not the humble not the poor serving the Lord, not the destitute or the broken. And we, as people of God, need to guard our hearts in this. Because what we think we've accomplished in this world may actually be negating what we could have accomplished eternally. And what we begin to value now will look like rags when we see them in the eyes of God. There's this haunting parable that Jesus tells in Luke 20. It's a parable about a man who had worked hard and he had done well financially and he was proud of his labors. Sounds like me. Jesus said, the land of a rich man was very productive. His business had done well. He began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. 
expand my savings account, diversify my portfolio, maybe open up a Roth IRA to complement that 401k or 403b. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and enjoy. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul will be required of you. And who will own all that you have prepared, i.e. not you? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. I want to ask a question for us all to seriously contemplate. Do you believe that if you were to die poor, die not being financially well off, die displaced in a foreign land, living in poor conditions. If you were to die, someone rejected and not thought, thought, well, not thought well of, and you were to die alone, and these things happened to you because of your service to Christ, do you believe that you would then, at death, begin to enjoy eternally the fruition of your sacrifice. While those who enjoy the comforts and fruit of earth now at the expense of sacrifice for Christ will die and have little, if any, hope for enjoyment eternally. My son is currently reading through a book, The Gates of Splendor, and it's a book that you may know about Jim Elliott, written by Elizabeth Elliott, who was a missionary to Ecuador and was murdered at the hands of the very people that he was trying to serve. And he has a quote, one of his famous quotes, he kept a diary that I think is appropriate. And he says, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot gain no, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I think the real shame of this situation of spending so much time clamoring about life now and pursuing and building up the wealth and possessions and the pleasures that we are trying to seek is that they are but shadows <laughs> of the fullness of goodness and truth and beauty and love that is only found in the triune God himself. St. Augustine has a line in which he says, God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. God will never give us something to satisfy the desires in our heart meant for him alone. We are all in the image of God and we are made for the God of that image. And all the clamoring that we do here is ultimately, even though we don't know it, know it in pursuit of the one who will ultimately satisfy. So I leave you with this. Where is your focus? Contemplate your death. Contemplate how fragile you are. Contemplate how brief this life really is so that you're storing up the treasures 
eternally that will not fade and will not rust and will not be corrupted. And then when the hand of death pushes you into the abyss, it will actually be the beginning of the eternity of enjoyment of God. Let us pray. Father, give us the grace to cultivate the humility we need to live for you. Give us the courage to face sacrifice so that we are storing up that which will not ever fade. We humbly come before you as those that you have created out of mercy and pray that our love for you only increases each and every day that you give us breath in this world. In your son's name we pray, amen.